This is the Rich Dad Radio Show. The good news and bad news about money. Here's Robert Kiyosaki. Hello, hello, hello. It's Robert Kiyosaki, the Rich Dad Radio Show, the good news and bad news about money. And uh, today's program, as all of our programs are, is very important because today is about education and the future. You see, for those of you who have read Rich Dad, Poor Dad, you already know that I really thought that, I mean, I have a college degree, Bachelor of Science, it was a great school and all that, but I learned nothing about money. And in fact, what I actually learned in school actually held me back. You know, it really slowed me down. You know, ideas like don't make mistakes and cheating is cooperation and all of these things. So we have a whole batches of people all over the world who think making mistakes makes you stupid when really making mistakes makes you smarter. And on top of that, if you're afraid of making mistakes, you can't think creatively. In other words, most people are working in an environment there. You're not allowed to think creatively because you think creatively, you're fired. You're fired. You're out of here. So that's why so many people sit there in their little cubicles, you know, tweeting away or on Facebook, or whatever you guys do in the little cubicles, and just saying, well, how come I'm trapped in here? So today we have a very important program. It's about you know, how education is evolving. Thank God it needs to evolve. And also, what's the next generation, Generation Z coming up, and how they're different than the millennials. So if you have kids, it's a very important uh, show. But also, if you're wondering what happened to your life, why am I stuck in this cubicle, or why am I stuck in a job I don't like, or why am I doing work that doesn't satisfy my spirit, this is your program. Any comments, Kim? Yes, I'm looking forward to today's show. And, uh, you know, for those of you who have listened to us over the years, um, this is going to be like singing to the choir, preaching to the choir. But our first guest, I just want to read a little segment from her book. And she says, many of the ideas presented in this book are the polar opposite of the lessons we are taught in a traditional education system. The rules that apply in school are often completely different from those in the outside world. Now, that sounds like something we would say, but the difference is, and we didn't think such a person existed on this planet, this is Dr. Tina Selig, and she is a professor at, at Stanford University School of Engineering and executive director of the Stanford Technology Ventures Program. So she is deep into the educational system, and she's saying basically what's taught in school, it does not in many cases apply to the real world. On top of that, she's not only in entrepreneurship, talking to engineers, but she's also, I believe, a neuroscientist, so she understands how the brains work. And as I said earlier, if you're afraid of losing your job, afraid of making mistakes, your creativity shuts down. So pay attention today for those of you who wonder what happened to your life or why am I not getting ahead or why am I afraid of stepping out, this is your program. So welcome to the program, Dr. Tina Silik. Honored to have you on the show. It's my pleasure. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. you. And Tina, you're the author of uh, What I Wish I Knew When I Was 20, A Crash Course on Making Your Place in the World in 2009. And your latest book uh, came out in 2015, Insight Out, Get Ideas Out of Your Head and Into the World. You bet. And there's actually one in between, which is called Ingenious, which is a crash course on creativity. Perfect. Well, thank you for doing that because, um, you know, The Rich Dad Poor Dad came out 20 years ago this year. Oh, wow. And I, I've been at war with, well, Poor Dad was an academic. He went to Stanford and Northwestern. <laughs> and he was head of education for the state of Hawaii. A very good man, but I was at war with him constantly because I kept flunking out of school. I mean, I did graduate, I did, did go to great, good schools. I, went, I was, had appointments at Naval Academy and the Merch Marine Academy, but I hated school. I just didn't know why I was there most of the time. And my dad was, even though head of education, he was a very, very good man. And he often said to me, son, you don't really belong in school. So he recognized that. So it's an honor to have you on the program because you're the first PhD I think we've had on this program where I'm not going to attack. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's see where this goes. So, so Tina, what, how did being a professor and being steeped in the educational system of, of Stanford and that world, how did you come up with the whole entrepreneurial mindset that you thought that was so important to teach the entrepreneurial mindset to your students? Well, this certainly isn't something new. There have been entrepreneurs since the dawn of time. 
And uh, I'm fortunate that I get to teach uh, students at Stanford who were in the engineering school, but also throughout the campus, about how to understand the knowledge, the skills, and the mindset that's required to actually bring your ideas to fruition. And your point is right on. There are often things that are taught in school that are really counter to the sort of things that really make you successful, uh, such as being willing to experiment, try lots of things, keep what works. And, of course, if you're too afraid to fail you're, and uh, you're not willing to take some risks, you probably aren't going to come up with anything really big and bold and new. How would you classify yourself as a neuroscientist or a neuro um, a brain? <laughs> well, listen, I finished my Ph.D. in neuroscience, uh, actually from Stanford Med School, many years ago, and I've had a very circuitous path since then. Um, and, in fact, I always sort of joke that if you told me at the beginning that uh, we really don't know how the brain works, it probably would have saved me a lot of time. Um, <laughs> but, but actually, that training as a scientist, no matter what the field, is critical because you're actually at the frontier. Scientists are really entrepreneurial. They're asking a lot of questions. They're trying to really make some breakthroughs. And uh, I think that the scientists who are the most successful are those who actually do have a really entrepreneurial mindset. In so, fact, I would argue that anyone in any field who has an entrepreneurial mindset is going to be much more successful at what they uh, try to accomplish. Right. So I'm going to ask you this question then. So speaking for our audience who's listening right now, what would you say to somebody right now who's afraid of being fired? You know, um, sitting, so wait, wait, sitting in a job they don't like, knowing they should do something else. What does the aspect of fear and retribution do to their creativity? Well, I think one of the interesting things is that people often feel tied to jobs that aren't a good fit for them. And often being fired or quitting is the most empowering thing you can do, is to say, you know, this is not working for me. Um, I'm going to go be successful somewhere else. Right, but that's, that's easier said than done. I mean, what, what is happening to them neurologically? That's, the, that's what I look at. I go, you know, I have people, people actually hate their work. And they're sitting there every day because, you know, I went 20, I went, I've been a doctor for 20 years and I really hate it. I want to get out. I hear, I hear that more from doctors than anybody else because of all the new, uh, you know, laws from, from corporate MBA programs taking over medicine. They're, 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 they're upset. Well, I think one of the things to keep in mind is that risk taking is really actually quite nuanced. You know, if, if you ask somebody, are they a risk taker, they're usually going to say yes or no. And, and I, I relate this to jobs because that's just one type of risk, right, being able to uh, uh, take that sort of either financial risk or social risk. Right, it might be a social risk to say I'm going to give up my, my very uh, highly regarded position as a physician or a lawyer or a professor uh, to go do something else. So that's sort of a social risk. But there's also a financial risk involved. You know, am I going to be able to support my family? Am I going to be able to pay my rent? Um, I do an exercise with my students where we actually parse risk taking. People, as I said, t tend to think of it as binary, but there are lots of types of risks. There are social risks, emotional risks, financial risks, physical risks, financial risks. Did, I don't know if I said that twice, but uh, ethical risks. And we each have a really different risk profile, and by understanding that, it allows us to know where it is we might want to try to in the future. Now, I, I understand. I understand that, and I thought it was very nice how you were interesting how you how you you know delicate or what you call that you made different distinctions about different types of risk. But my question is, what happens to a person who sits there? You know, it's like how why did why were so people why were people so afraid of being whistleblowers against Fox? You know, even though they're being sexually abused, and the excuse was, well, I had a career. I want to I want to stay here. And I want, as a medical or a uh, neuroscience, to my to my opinion, that eats your soul up. You sit there at a job you hate, being harassed, being punished, being abused, but you sit there. What goes on beyond all that? Why don't they get out of that? Right. Well, I wouldn't. I'm not going to pretend to be a, an expert on that, but I, I, I clearly. Um, there's always the situation of, you know, the devil you know versus the devil you don't know, right? They're the people who are just very fearful, and it's a very deep emotional reaction to change. I mean, some people are very comfortable with change. Other people are very, very uncomfortable with it. But the key is to understand what are the consequences. I mean, if you fully unpack what are the consequences of what's going to happen and to realize that it's probably not so bad. I mean, unless you're going to take some physical risk where you're going to jump out of a perfectly good airplane without a well-packed parachute and you're going to die, most of the risks we take in our life are not as 
difficult. So what's, the consequences are not as dire as we imagine. Yeah, once again, it's Robert Kiyosaki, the Rich Dad Radio Show. We're talking to Dr. Tina Silik. She's a PhD from Stanford, and she talks about, you know, she's singing my, my song right here about how our schools sometimes actually prevent us from being entrepreneurs and being creative thinkers. And it's a very important subject. So I'm, all of you out there who are listening right now who are in a job you hate or not making enough money, you know, I mean, what's holding you back is really the question. And the thing I liked about when I was reading Dr. Tina Selig's book, she says a lot of times it affects your creativity because, you know, logic comes from the prefrontal cor cortex, but fear comes from the gut. And when those two things are hitting you and you can't function, it's a horrifying story. So another thing I loved about your book, What I Wish I Knew When I Was 20, you talk about how money actually gets in the way and you give your students this $5 you know, challenge. See, yeah, it's really interesting. So let, can I quickly explain yeah. that? I actually opened the book with that story, and yeah. it's, that story's become quite, quite, um, I guess maybe even famous. People have tried it all over the world, and it's a really sort of a um, designed to be an eye-opening experience. I gave the students uh, envelopes with $5 in it, and I told them they had as much time as they wanted to plan, but as soon as they opened up that envelope, they had two hours to uh, make as much money as possible, and they had $5. There were the people who did the obvious things, you know, start a lemonade stand, you know, by using the $5 to buy the ingredients or a car wash or a bake sale. But there were the people who realized that, A, the $5 was actually a distraction. They, thank, you that, for, thank you for saying that. All you guys with paychecks out there, that paycheck is your distraction. Well, the thing is there were so many other opportunities out there that, and that their skills were worth so much more than $5. You know, and whether it was setting up a bike, a stand to pump up bike tires in the middle of campus or making reservations at different restaurants and then selling them as the time came up or taking photos at the, at the you know, one of the school events and, and essentially selling people these beautiful photos of themselves. That, that essentially there were all these things they could do with resources they already had, that the $5 was a distraction. Right. And, and these teams end up making hundreds of dollars as opposed to, you know, uh, tens of, of dollars, they made hundreds. Huh. And it was just an incredible reminder that we have many, many more resources at our disposal than we think. Um, it's funny, I was down in Chile um, a couple few years ago, and it was in this gorgeous environment. You know, looking out on one side was the ocean, on the other side were the mountains. And I asked the people in the room, gosh, what's getting in the way of your economic prosperity? And they said, very quickly, our terrible environment. And honestly, I looked outside the windows and thought this is one of the most beautiful, amazing places, but they were measuring themselves relative to some other places in the world, like Silicon Valley. And we, I said, well, of course you're not like Silicon Valley, but that's great because you have something very unique that we cannot offer. And so I think that we often compare ourselves to others as opposed to looking at the resources that we personally control that we can really leverage. Once again, it's Robert Kiyosaki, the Rich Dad Radio Show. We're talking to Dr. Tina Silik, and we're and I'm asking her about, which is a brilliant, brilliant uh, exercise she had give students. You have that $5, and actually $5 to go and create something. The $5 actually limits their thinking is what I'm getting at. Because Kim and I used to do this exercise years and years ago, and we taught entrepreneurship. We'd actually throw people on the street with no money and nothing. Uh -huh. and, and, and women could not talk to men. They only had to talk to women. Couldn't use, no, no sexual hooks could be used, and you had to go out there and get an elegant meal. And what happened with people, the, there was people who the fear just paralyzed them. They, they actually got stuck on the street. They couldn't do anything, and other people had major breakthroughs. So the whole point here, which I love the start of your book, it's what I wish I knew when I was 20. And this is why my rich dad never paid me any money. He says, when I pay you money, you get stupid. You become, you're an employee. You need a paycheck. You're not an entrepreneur. And, and you know, my, my poor dad, who, like I said, went to Stanford, thought that was the cruelest thing he could do to me, is not pay me something. So that's yeah. why I'm very happy with your book. When we come back, we'll be going to more what you can do to enhance your creativity and not be hindered by a $5 paycheck. We'll be right back. You're listening to The Rich Dad Radio Show with Robert Kiyosaki. 
Every business owner and real estate investor needs asset protection. Entities like LLCs, S, or C Corps are vital to protect yourself and your business. Let Corporate Direct guide you through the process of forming a corporation or LLC. Corporate Direct is owned by Rich Dad Advisor Garrett Sutton and is Robert Kiyosaki's choice for corporate formation. Mention Rich Dad and receive $100 off a formation. Call 800-600-1760. That's 800-600-1760. Or visit online at CorporateDirect.com. That's CorporateDirect.com. Log on to RichDadRadio.com while you listen. Now back to Robert Kiyosaki. Welcome back, Robert Kiyosaki, the Rich Dad Radio Show, the good news and bad news about money. Once again, you can listen to the Rich Dad Radio program anytime, anywhere on iTunes or Android. And all of our programs are, are, are archived at richdadradio.com. And we archive them because one of the ways people learn is by a repetition. In other words, you can't learn to play golf taking one golf lesson. You've got you to swing the club probably a million times to turn pro. Please listen to this program again, especially if you're stuck in a job working for that $5 paycheck, wondering what happened to my life. You know, why am I selling my life for a paycheck and people I don't like? It just doesn't make sense to me. So you can go to this, uh, you can go to Rich Dad Radio, listen to this program again, and also share it with friends, family, and workmates, and discuss it, especially if you're trapped like monkeys inside this little cubicle going, what happened to my life? So I'm very happy to have Dr. Tina Selig. She has a fantastic new book. Well, new book called Inside Out, but the book I really like is What I Wish I Knew When I Was 20. And what she says is exactly what I've been, what my rich dad taught me. My poor dad went to Stanford, and he was terrified of making mistakes, terrified of losing his paycheck, terrified of losing his job, all of that stuff. And my rich dad never paid me. He says, if I pay you money, you'll be stuck to a paycheck for the for the rest of your life. And, you know, Kim and I used to have this saying called WIMP, W-I-M-P, stands for Where Is My Paycheck? You know, and, and, and that's what happens to people, which is why I'm so glad you're doing what you're doing at Stanford and teaching the best and the brightest about how to think outside the box. But as, as it's fear that prevents people from being creative. And yes, and here's, here's what I see as, as best I can sum it up, is so many students, I mean, myself included, we come out of school scared to death of making a mistake, thinking there's only one right answer. We're afraid of problems. And what you're doing with your students is you're, you're teaching them, you're giving them an entrepreneurial mindset, you're telling them that mistakes are actually how you learn, mistakes are a good thing, problems, there's solutions, look for the solutions in the problems, and there's not just one right answer. So these your students are coming out of school not with all that fear and paralysis that so many other students have. Is that is that about sum it up? Well, uh, yes, that is absolutely what I'm trying to do. And in fact, I... Thank you for doing that. Yeah. Uh, well, you know, it's interesting. We... we one of the biggest problems in the education system is that we really do, you know, have to measure whether people have learned the material. But as a result, we've created exams with, you know, multiple choice and one right answer. And not only does it teach people that there's one right answer and this sort of gets drilled in their head that, uh, there, you know, if you don't have the right answer, you fail, but um, it also... Uh, prevents us from measuring a lot of things that are really hard to measure. Uh, there's a wonderful quote which says something to the effect of not all things that count can be counted and not all things that can be counted count. And I think that's really profound. Um, how do you measure love? How do you measure ethics? How do you measure creativity? And unfortunately, because it's difficult to measure these things, we actually don't teach them. And what a huge mistake. So um, I give lots of opportunities for my students to practice a lot of the things that are difficult to measure and I tell them I don't ever want to talk about grades because they get very confused often about like thank well, you you know how am I how am I going to measure up it's like you know what I we're going to be looking at how much effort and 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 energy you put into this as opposed to the specific outcome because in the world of innovation entrepreneurship there are a lot of false starts and you can't punish people for trying things if they don't work the first time so you have you have a thing called a failure uh, diary or something or the failure, failure resume. resume. Yeah. I require my students to write a failure resume. Now you know that sounds all very um, you know kind of funny, but it's critically important because if you you don't learn from your failures, you're missing an opportunity. I I like to think about failure quite differently than a lot of other people. Instead of saying saying failure is good, I look at failure as data. Right, as a scientist. If you do something that doesn't turn out as you expect, that's really
really interesting data, and often that's the most powerful, you know, opportunity. I mean, lots of incredible inventions and discoveries have come from things that were surprising results. And so we should be mining our quote-unquote failures for data. And so I have my students write failure resumes, you know, their biggest screw-ups or disappointments, professional, academic, social, emotional, and, but they can't just write them down. They have to write down what they learned from it. Yes. And what I've learned through my experience doing this over the years is not only do you learn more, but you also can let go of those things much more quickly. They don't, they don't end up becoming things that you carry with you. Right, because you've got the uh, lesson out of them. You can much more quickly. Yep, yep. You know, and you know what else I, I love in your book, Tina, in your, and in your classroom? You do, these, you do you these projects with your students, and you use Post-its and paper clips and rubber bands, and you send them out on this project, and they start to see that there's a lot of possibilities, a lot of opportunities. And you say afterwards, many reflected afterwards that they would never have an excuse for being broke since there was always a nearby problem begging to be solved. Absolutely. I, I think it was mind-altering for many, many people, is to realize that if they looked at the world through the lens of possibilities, there were amazing solutions and, and ideas and ways that they could uh, thrive. And making money is actually only one type of value. I think this is really important. There's value can be measured in lots of different ways, right? There's um, emotional value. There's educational value. There's humor. Um, so, so. If we just look at value in terms of money, uh, that's one way you can go, but there are lots of other ways that you can create things of value in, in all aspects of our lives. Right. That's, that's why my rich dad always said to me, the rich don't work for money. They, they want to solve problems first. This is critical, actually. Yeah. This and, is and, really and, critical. But, um, but, but Emmett, why do the school always say go to school to get a job? Isn't that the work for money? I mean, that's what makes me nauseous, personally. You know, there's some interesting insights from people who are entrepreneurs. So those people who are just motivated by money end up giving up long before those people who are really motivated to solve an important problem. Yeah, because it's not, it's not a strong enough reason why to keep going. It's easier to you quit. You got it. If I'm trying to find, you know, a solution for a big problem and it's a problem I really care about, then I'm going to push through all those barriers. If I'm just motivated by money. Now, honestly, I have seen some people who have come from very disadvantaged backgrounds, who are really motivated really to feed their family and to send their kids to school. And I think for some people, money can be a really important motivator. And so I don't want to discount that. I mean, we do want to um, provide a better life for our family. But it's important to understand there are lots of other things that we can tap into as motivation that are um, just as, if not more, powerful. Those are very wise words, and I really thank you for writing your book, What I Wish I Knew When I Was 20. And thank you for being at the bastion of higher education, Stanford University, and sharing knowledge that the bright, best and the brightest should know. Because, you know, to me, there's nothing worse than fear and the fear of failing, the fear of not making mistakes, and the fear of not having money is why people stay stuck working for that five bucks. And, and Tina, let me ask, too, how, how do your other associates take your, your philosophy and your, your, how you work with your students? Well, I work with many, many like-minded people who are very entrepreneurial. You know, if you go into our office, there'll be two big signs that are painted in very large text on the walls. One says, every problem is an opportunity. The bigger the problem, the bigger the opportunity. And the other one says, entrepreneurs do much more than imaginable with much less than seems possible. I mean, these are, this is our philosophy that we share with all of our students. I have many, many colleagues who are just as passionate about this as I am. Good. So please spread that to colleagues all over the world. <laughs> if you would, we would appreciate it. <laughs> so thank you, Tina. Thank you for your time and keep up the good work. Thank you so much. It was my pleasure. Thank, thank you. you, Tina. So again, thank you to Tina Selig, Dr. Tina Selig. And I really wish I had teachers like her when I was younger. In all my times, I only had two teachers that inspired me. My favorite teacher of all was a B-17 pilot during World War II. He got shot down, almost captured, and escaped. And then he went on to become a professor of English at Harvard University. And so when I met him, I asked him what was the meaning of life, and he just said, adventure. He says, go for it. And it wasn't this BS about stay in school and get a job and all that. And he inspired me, and that's why I became a pilot in Vietnam. It was one of the best adventures I could ever have. Who's your favorite well, teacher, Kim? Yeah, I did have a favorite teacher in college, and the reason was um, we weren't just studying a book. 
it was a marketing class, which I love marketing. That's where I w- that's where I ended up. But it was we actually went out and we took what we were learning and we took it into the workplace. We had a big project. We worked with companies. They gave us advice. They gave us mentorship. We were out there in the real world doing the real thing, and that was exciting. So again, thank you to Dr. Selig. Please read her book, What I Wish I Knew When I Was 20. She also talks about keeping a failure journal. I mean, I just sit in your little cubicle or you're trying to make some money today. Are you afraid of making a mistake? Are you afraid if you make a mistake, you'll get fired? What a horrible place to live. What a horrible place to spend your life being afraid all the time. No wonder people have, you know, stomach ulcers or they can't go to the toilet. They're all constipated. How does it feel to live with fear all the time, fear of not having money and fear of not of failing and being fired? What do you want to say about that, Kim? Well, it, it goes back to when my when my dad, when he was in his early 50s and he got fired and he was rising up in the company to be the company president and, and that didn't happen and he got fired. And for me, that was the biggest wake up call because at that point I was, I was like, I don't want to be in a position where somebody can dictate what's going to happen to me in my life. And I think that's where that entrepreneurial light bulb first got, first got ignited. So come up and meet the next generation, Gen Z. We've heard about the millennials and what a pack of wimps they are. <laughs> <laughs> and, but the good news is we have a whole other generation coming up called Gen Z. And they're very different than the baby boomers, which Kim and I are part of. Very different from Gen X, different than the millennials, and now we have Gen Z. So these guys are the next generation. They're leaving college right now, and we better be prepared for them. You'll find out whether Gen Z is better or worse than the millennials. You're listening to The Rich Dad Radio Show with Robert Kiyosaki. Rich Dad Coaching offers a phenomenal variety of services and custom strategies, all aimed at ensuring a secure, comfortable, and rich future for you and your family. Now you can get weekly access to exclusive Rich Dad Coaching services through our live stream events. Go to richdad.com and click on the On Demand banner at the top of the homepage. Great new videos are updated regularly. Get inside knowledge and insights from Robert Kiyosaki himself, Rich Dad Coaching professionals, and more. Go to richdad.com and click on the On Demand banner at the top of the homepage. This is the Rich Dad Radio Show, the good news and bad news about money. Here's Robert Kiyosaki. Welcome back, Robert Kiyosaki, the Rich Dad Radio Show. So once again, you can listen to the Rich Dad Radio Show anytime, anywhere on on iTunes or Android, and all of our all of our programs are archived at richdadradio.com. And we archive our podcast because repetition is how we learn. And the more you hear this, listen to this program, the more you learn. And the best thing about learning is if you share it with friends and family or business partners and discuss it, your learning goes quantum at that point. And I want to thank again Dr. Tina Selig from um, Stanford University, what I wish I knew when I was 20. And she talks about how oftentimes what school teaches you goes counter to what is required in the real world, which I agree with. And I think the most important thing about that book was that experiment she had when she gave the students $5. The $5 actually got in their way. And my, my point of view is your paycheck gets in the way. You know, well, you know, I, I, I'm making $50,000 a year. I can't give this up. Well, $5 and $50,000 are the same problem. It actually screws up your brain. So now we have a whole different subject, and this is interesting because we've been talking about the millennials in, in several of our programs, and now there's a new generation called Gen Z, and Gen Z was actually raised by Gen X, where the baby boomers raised the millennials. So um, on our program now, we have- I didn't raise any millennials. <laughs> Thank God. <laughs> <laughs> so right now we have a father and son team. This is really, really interesting. They've written a book called Gen Z at Work. David Stillman, he's author and generational expert. He's the author of When Generations Collide. And he and his son, Jonah, who's a 17-year-old high school senior who's about to buy his first rental property, co-wrote uh, the book Gen Z at Work, How the Next Generation is Transforming the Workplace. So David and Jonah, welcome to the program. Thanks for having us. Hey, David, uh, you, you're doing the dad, or is Jonah teaching you? Which, which way is it nowadays? <laughs> well, I, the nice thing is, and we see this a lot amongst Gen Z, is that they, he's just so receptive to being mentored. And so, you know, Jonah's wide open to learning and 
uh, you know, doesn't believe it's all out with the old and in with the new. At the same time, I got to say, Jonah has brought so much to my career in business that it really is a two-way street. And that's the beautiful thing about bridging generational gaps. Fantastic. And again, I asked this question earlier when we're off air. Why do you think writing this book, Gen Z at Work, is important to entrepreneurs like Kim and I? So years ago, uh, I've been saying the generations now for 20 years, and I'm a Gen Xer. And when my generation showed up in the workplace, everyone tried to treat us like the baby boomers. And it backfired. I and mean, the reason was we were just looking through a completely different lens. And what, what recruiting is- to retaining what is Gen X? What is Gen X? What, what were the dates? 1946 to six. Uh, sorry, 19, <laughs> 1964 to 1980. Okay. 46 good. to 64 is the Boomers, and then 1964 to 1980 is Gen X. And of course, the, the most important generation are the Boomers. You of agree course, with that, of don't course, you? Of course. You see, well, that's why <laughs> no one paid attention when my generation. That's what. <laughs> that's what I'm getting boomer. at. So, what, what was the biggest <laughs> difference? What was the biggest difference from Gen X to Baby Boomers? What was the biggest difference? Oh, I think one was first of all, 80 million boomers. They really had to, you know, compete to stand out amongst the crowd. So it became a generation that followed rules and regulations, policies and procedures, a lot of you know, internal politics. Then along came Gen X, close to half the size at 60 million. And suddenly it wasn't as competitive. And you had a generation that was willing to challenge status quo. And they pushed back because they didn't believe that just because the way it's always been done doesn't mean it's going to be better. And so Gen X just pushed back, and they got labeled as not team players, slackers, not loyal, and it just wasn't true. And the problem was people weren't understanding the world that Gen Z had grown up in and the lens they were looking for. So they so, 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 flash for But you also said the, the boomers raised the millennials, so it's our fault. <laughs> The millennials are our fault. I love love the millennials. They're just different. But, you know, what happened is it's been millennials all the time. And you cannot go a day without hearing something about the millennials. And so now what happens is Gen Z is showing up, and I'm seeing history repeat itself. No one is paying attention to a generation that is so different. And if we try to treat Gen Z like the millennials once again, it's going to backfire and cause wait, wait, a lot of collisions. Yeah, I know, but I'm, I'm asking the question. So you're saying the baby boomers are the guys responsible for those wimps and whiners called <laughs> millennials? <laughs> is that what you're saying? Well, I will say it is often funny to me that many of the people who complain to me about millennials are the same people who raised them. So, <laughs> you know, I, I will say that. So, so Jonah, so Jonah. Um, so Gen Z, does Gen Z, do they not all don't don't they all want what, a trophy? What, what were the what was Gen Z? What were the dates? Not 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 at all. So yeah, Gen Zers were born. We're the generation after the millennials. Were born between the years 1995 and 2012, and that's just one of the differences. You said, do I not one of those? Do I not want one of those trophies? You know, I was never given one. I was never given that participation award. Um, I was raised very differently than a millennial. You know, at a young age, not right or wrong, um, millennials were told that, you know, if they work hard with their peers, at the end of the day, if they tried their hardest, they're a winner. And I was told, you know, hey, there's 80 million Gen Zers out there. If you're not willing to work your butt off, you're probably going to be a loser. So the idea of winners and losers came to be. The participation were completely vanished. Uh, Gen X parents were really turned off by that idea. So naturally, as Gen Zers start to go to college and emerge in the workplace, we are a lot more competitive than the millennial generation. The millennial generation, excuse me, and that's just one of the differences between us. So, so Jonah, let me ask you this: um, How come I keep hearing about, you know, they threw they throw these right wing speakers off Berkeley campus, and the students are saying they don't want ideas that threaten them? Is that your generation? I think that us Gen Zers were very open to new ideas. We're exposed to so much new information that, you know, we don't really have a choice. If you think about it, I can get any amount of information at any time when I go on my phone. So if you're closed minded, you're going to be growing up in a pretty troubled world then because you're exposed to so many different viewpoints at every at any amount of time. So why why is it they're saying that they're closed minded? I think part of the issue is they are growing up in what's been called the echo chamber. And that is, you know, they can get their hands on any bit of information they want, but they're also able to pick any news source that is a direct match to their values and ideals. And it is a sort of a concern is that this generation doesn't hear enough of the opposing position. So oftentimes when we hear, you know, people feel that they're maybe closed-minded, it's just that they often are not exposed to enough of the people who think differently than themselves. Right. It's what makes is if it leads, it bleeds. So it's a bad story. So people listen to it. Right. Okay, once again, it's Robert Kiyosaki, the Rich Dad Radio Show. We're talking to David Stillman and his son, Jonah Stillman. Jonah is still in school. 
and we're talking about Gen Z, the next baby boom coming through the pipeline right now, which is as big as the baby boom generation as they baby boomers fade into the sunset. And the question is, how do you work with Gen Z? So uh, Jonah, being the younger of the generation, what message would you like to give to the old guys about how to work with you guys? This year, this spring, Gen Z, or the leading edge of Gen Z will be exiting college and entering the workforce. And you know, what, what frustrates me and concerns me the most is that, you know, there's a lot, a lot of min millennial fatigue out there. People are kind of, you know, sick of hearing about the millennials, talking about the millennials. They really are the most talked about, the most talked about generation in history. And why I think that's going to be a problem is that a lot of people will kind of clump Gen Zers into that millennial generation. And while that's not true, what that means is that uh, a lot of people are going to be closed-minded with Gen Z as we enter the workforce. They're not even going to give us a shot to show us who we are and why the way we work is so beneficial. So I think I'd encourage a lot of leaders in the workforce, you know, be open-minded with the new generation. Just because we don't work the same way as you doesn't mean that's necessarily a bad thing. And I think that our knowledge of technology and the way we have so innately can operate so many different platforms is going to be something that's really, really powerful and beneficial to the work. Right. So uh, your boss will be probably a millennial. Correct. And that's, that's another whole problem is that we have to teach millennials how to now be managers. They're no longer your summer interns. They're going to be the ones that are going to be on the front line dealing with us Gen Zers on a day-to-day -day basis. And if we don't know how to bring our two different working strategies together, there will be a lot of generational clashes that start to show that's up. A good, that's a really good point. And, you know, I've also read from some of your work, you said that, um, David, that Gen Z and, and Jonah, too, you're, you're now questioning the value of higher education. You're questioning universities. And is, is that really Correct. a value? Is that a is that where, where are you at with that? Go ahead, David. I was just going to say that this section is struggling um, you know, because the value proposition that I think John started to say has always been come discover yourself at college. And here's a generation that feels, you know what, if I'm going to go to college at all, I better know what I want to do. 61% of Gen Z said they need to know what career they're pursuing if they're even going to go to college. So the value proposition has changed because if you say to this generation, come discover yourself, you're talking to a generation that already feels they know. And so the new value proposition really needs to be, you know what you want, we're going to get you there. But on top of that, 75% of Gen Z said there's good ways of getting education other than by going to college at all. They're just seeing so many millennials saddled with college debt. And they're also hearing from professionals across the board that, sure, I'll take someone who's gotten good grades, but I'll take someone who's got work experience even before that. And what about, like, all the college debt, all those school loans? Is that factoring into this as well? Definitely. Uh, so, jo Jonah, as a, you're in high school right now and all this, um, are you planning on going to college? You know, I'm living... Amongst the Gen Z trend, I decided not to go to college right away. I'm going to take at least one year off to get some more work experience, continue speaking, and just trying to represent the voice of Gen Z. And, you know, I figured that while I have the opportunity to keep working, I might as well ride the wave, and college will always be there. So until I know exactly what I want to study, I think I'm going to hold off on going to college. That's an interesting thought because my friend, um, I won't mention his name because he's pretty famous, he gave his son that choice, and he said, go take some time off and the kid took some time off and never came back <laughs> yeah but he's a lot happier he's in, he's outside in mongolia or something working on a project that has meaning to him is that important to you see that that, that that's exactly the the gen z trend right there if you have something that you are passionate about that you want to do we see no reason to drop everything and all of a sudden go to college because we've been told by our parents that you know college will always be there and that it's so important that you figure out exactly what you want to do because you don't want to go bounce around for a year. You know, while that might, people always say, well, is that true? You're trying to grow up too fast. And that, that could be seen as a problem, but we're so concerned about drowning in college debt that we necessarily don't find the need to go right away. And David, as a parent, how does that make you feel? I mean, you know, it's, doesn't the fear come up, oh, if my son doesn't go to college, he'll be behind or not make it in the world? Is that, that a concern? Oh, 100%. I mean, the funny thing is here, I wrote about it in a book. I lecture about it. I'm on the media talking about how more and more Gen Zers are looking at alternative paths to higher ed. And then when my own son said, you know, he's not going to college, that was a hard one to swallow. And I think a lot of it is the path for the rest of, for the rest of us has always been high school, you go to college, and the only way you're going to have a good degree, a good career, rather, is if you have a degree. And yet I've really seen that model change. So many executives that meet Jonas were out – keynote speaking to industries literally across the board, every one of them is saying to him, 
you know, why would you go to college? They're doing such important work right now that you need to ride this wave. You need to capture this experience. And so, I mean, I'm seeing so many people in the business world support this path of his that um, I'm there. But sure, in the back of my mind, am I wondering if he will ever go? You bet. But that being said, I do know that if he doesn't go, it won't be because he's slacking off because he's pursuing a path really hard. And what I have seen in Jonah's work ethic, um, I am not concerned about his future. Yeah, and I, I don't, I've never met the two of you, David, uh, the dad and Jonah, the son, but I can tell by Jonah's um, tone of voice and his enthusiasm, you're very excited about the next few years, right, and your education. No, I'm, I'm, I could not be more excited. You know, I'm, I'm counting down these last 19 days of till graduation, you know, and I think uh, that's, that's schools in the past for now. I'm just really excited. You know, I decided that in a year from now, I'll reevaluate and if college is the right decision, then I'll go. But until then, I'm just all eyes forward on focusing on work. Well, I want to thank you, both David Stillman and Jonas Stillman. The book is Gen Z at Work. It's a very important book for not only old guys like me who employ people, but also for parents and for younger people to know you have other options because this is the world of the internet or the World Wide Web. And you can get you can get education and information everywhere. You don't have to go to school. So thank you guys for writing your book. Thank and you, David. Thank you, Jonah. Us. Pleasure. Thank, thank you for having us. All right. Thank and you. And we come back. We're going to the next most popular program. It's called Ask Robert. You're listening to the Rich Dad Radio Show with Robert Kiyosaki. Every business owner and real estate investor needs asset protection. Entities like LLCs. S or C Corps are vital to protect yourself and your business. Let Corporate Direct guide you through the process of forming a corporation or LLC. Corporate Direct is owned by Rich Dad Advisor Garrett Sutton and is Robert Kiyosaki's choice for corporate formation. Mention Rich Dad and receive $100 off a formation. Call 800 600 1760. That's 800 600 1760. Or visit online at corporatedirect.com. That's CorporateDirect.com. The key to achieving your dreams is to develop a rich mindset instead of an excuse mindset. Instead of saying, I can't afford that, ask yourself, how can I afford that? It's amazing how a simple shift in thinking can open a world of new ideas and endless possibilities. Let the Rich Dad Company help kickstart your journey to financial freedom. Robert Kiyosaki and the Rich Dad Company have compiled Robert's top secrets to creating a rich mindset, now available in a 10-minute ebook, How to Achieve a Rich Mindset. This offer is available for a limited time only, so get yours today. Get your free ebook, How to Achieve a Rich Mindset. Go to richdad.com and look for the banner. Again, this is available only for a few days, so act fast. Go to richdad.com and look for the How to Achieve a Rich Mindset banner. It pays to listen. Now back to Robert Kiyosaki and the Rich Dad Radio Show. Welcome back, Robert Kiyosaki, the Rich Dad Radio Show, the good news and bad news about money. Once again, you can listen to the Rich Dad Radio program anytime, anywhere on iTunes or Android. And to listen to this program again, we have archived it at richdadradio.com. And the reason we archive them is because repetition is how we learn. For instance, you never learn to play golf. Swing a golf club just once. So anyway, for those of you who want to learn more, listen to this program again and again, and then share it with friends and family and discuss it. It is that discussion and sharing you will hear and get, your brain will expand and you'll understand things you didn't understand before and you'll see new possibilities. Thanks to our guest, Dr. Tina Selig, who wrote the book, What I Wish I Knew When I Was 20 and Insight Out. And um, I thought it was fascinating with David and Jonah Stillman. They wrote the book Gen Z at Work. And one of the points they make in their book is that Gen Z grew up in the Great Recession. You know, the millennials grew up when it hey, was all We're still boom. in the Great Recession. Yeah, but the, we, but the millennials were all the boom, boom, boom. And the, so they're saying that the Gen Z grew up in the Great Recession. So they're more of a survival pragmatic mode. So it's different. It's, it's interesting. Interesting read and interesting in for the future. Very insightful, which, which we yep. should have. So once again, we're going to ask Robert. You can submit your questions to ask Robert at richdadradio.com. So Melissa, what's the first question? Our first question today comes from Angel in California. Favorite book, Cash Flow Quadrant. With all these unpredictable events happening so fast and constant in our world and uncertainty ahead, do you believe college is a good investment for young adults? 
I see it more and more that the school system in the U.S. is conditioning and drilling the idea into the heads of kids that they must go to college to be successful. Is this true from your perspective? That's a great question, but it depends upon where you're going in your life. For example, if you're going to be a doctor, a lawyer, or accountant, you got to go to college. You're going to be an entrepreneur. You don't have to be one. But you still need education is the point. The question is where are you getting your information? And what I thought about, interesting about Gen Z at work by David Stillman and Jonah Stillman, they said that Gen Z, 40% would rather have Wi-Fi than a toilet in their place to work because the Wi-Fi connects them to the world, which is one way of saying is our, our traditional hall, Ivy Halls of education are obsolete. You know, you really don't have to physically go to school and sit in a classroom listening to a teacher you don't really respect, which I never, I only have had a few teachers I respected, which was my problem. But anyway, where are you going in life? So because I was gonna be an entrepreneur, and I knew that that's why my rich dad said, never work for money, don't take that paycheck. And that's what Dr. Tina Selick is saying from Stanford University. It's in that first chapter, which I thought was brilliant. The $5 represents that paycheck. And the more you have that paycheck mentality, you can't get out because your prefrontal cortex is so feared. What if I don't have money? What if I fail? And that's what they teach in school. Any comments, Kim? Yeah, well, I, I congratulate Angel because I think one of the big things that's coming up now, because we've always, I mean, I was taught, you know, you, you go to you graduate high school, you go to college. It's like a given. And for the first time we heard it from Jonah Stillman, Angel's asking the question, they're thinking for themselves and they're really questioning, is this really good bang for the buck? Am yeah. I really going to get what I want to get out of college? And they're thinking and they're asking the question. I think that's the most important thing. And the reason we created the Rich Dad Company, you know, is this, there's professional education. You can be an entrepreneur. Professional education is different than financial education. The tools are very, very different. If you like the, if you like the cash flow quadrant, E's and S's don't need financial statements. B's and I's, big business and professional investor, you live and die by financial statements. And so even though a person's an entrepreneur learning to make money, they may ne never transition, which is S quadrant, small business. They may never transition to B and the I. So what Richard Ed basically teaches is the financial statement. That's why your banker never asks you for your report card. Your banker wants your financial statement. When I go to my banker and all this, the reason I can get a loan is I have a very, very compelling financial statement, millions and millions of dollars, and that's why they'll give me as much debt as I want. But if you don't have a financial statement and all you have is one of those tinky tinky little FICO scores, you're not gonna get anywhere in the life, not in the B and the I quadrant. So there's a difference between professional education and financial education. Next question, please. Our next question comes from Dominic in Switzerland. Favorite book, Rich Dad, Poor Dad. He says, Robert, recently I told a friend of mine about you and your radio show. He was quite critical and replied, if he was truly rich, he wouldn't give away his secrets. Because of his outright <laughs> negativity, I decided it wasn't worth the trouble trying to convince him otherwise. But I'm still stumped at his level of ignorance, especially since his parents are quite wealthy themselves. How would you have responded to this kind of criticism? That is a fantastic question because you're observing life. There's many people who get rich by being greedy and they make rich people, all rich people, bad. And there are rich people who are very generous. I'm not really religious, but I remember from Sunday school, give and you shall receive. And so I face the same dilemma all the time. I ask these very successful guys, I say, would you mind coming up for a why should I share my secrets? And so they would rather just hang on to their secrets. But what they fail to realize is the spiritual aspect of sharing their secrets is the more you give, the more you learn. So when I'm talking, we do this radio show, I'm learning just as much even though I kind of know what I'm talking about, right? The more yeah. you give, the more you receive. Oh, yeah. And I mean, it's always been our philosophy, always been our philosophy that information is meant to be shared. I mean, we give away a lot for free, and, and we always have, and it's never been an issue for us. Because and sort of our advisors, they share anything you want, but you could, you know, that's our philosophy. But there's very greedy people yeah. out there. Well, you put, your, you put your stuff out to the world, and more people hear about it, more people learn from it, more mass you attract, more people come in. So I, I, I don't understand the greedy part of it. I don't understand why somebody would be so insecure to say, oh, I can't share my secrets. You, you should be sharing your secrets. That's how you're going to get more wealthy, my opinion. 
But there's greedy people and there's generous people, and I thank you to ask I, that question. You know, Be- I, I also have to ask the, the guy who said that, who has very wealthy parents, I wonder where, where, that, if that philosophy them. came from the parents. Maybe that's their philosophy as well. I, we all know those types of people. We all know those types of people. They're so tight, they squeak when they walk. The world, Next question, the world Melissa. doesn't like greedy rich people, I don't think. No, they give, they give rich people a bad name. Next question, Melissa. Our next question comes from Georgie in Bulgaria. Favorite book, Rich Dad, Poor Dad. He says, Robert, your books have basically broadened my world and my mindset. I would love to know about the first property you and Kim bought and how you leveraged debt to acquire it. What was your equity on it? Well, I don't think it's so much the equity as what did I learn before I bought the property. And I'm very excited about Bulgaria because I've heard about some of the real estate opportunities I, you know, on the oceanfront properties and all this. But I like Bulgaria because it's an, it's an emerging nation. So the thing I would say to you is that this is invest first in your education, you'll see even more because there's opportunities everywhere. That's why Dr. Tina Selig's book, What I Wish I Knew When I Was 20, about that $5, you know, that it actually got in their way. You actually make more money when you have no money. We had um, Damon John of Shark Tank, you know, of FUBU, and he says the same thing. He says, when you don't have money, you're actually getting smarter because you have to come up with many, 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 many ideas. Whereas when a person's afraid, which Dr. Seeley is talking about, their brain shuts down. They can't think creatively. So the most important thing I would say to this young person is, especially being in Bulgaria where you have, I know you have a lot of Russians moving in there right now. And they have a different energy than Americans. You know, so when I'm dealing with Russians, it's a different deal. They're different cultures. They're not good or bad. They have different cultures. So you're sitting on a very great opportunity place, but I would actually invest in your education first because my first deal was no money, zero. The moment I bought my first property was zero, I knew I was free. It wasn't much of a cash flow return, but $25 on zero is an infinite return. But once I knew that, I was free. And that's exactly what Damon John is saying. That's what Tina Selig is saying. The moment you realize you don't need that $5 or that money, you're free. And that's the most important thing. Common skin. Well, I just look at our, our past. Your first property, you you had no money. The first property I bought, we had no money. And that did make us get very, very creative. We had to figure it out because we wanted that. We wanted that property. You know, when we built our businesses, we had no money. So we were hungry, as Damon John said. Listen to that show. Listen to Damon John's show. He said, when you're hungry, you want it bad, so you're going to do whatever it takes. And I, I think knows, that's the biggest benefit is not having the money. And what Kim knows about me, I start a company. I don't have any money. Because when I don't have any money, I'm actually more creative and smarter. And so when I when I meet some future entrepreneurs says I can't do it because I don't have any money, I know I'm talking to a person whose prefrontal cortex is locked down. They have some bad education from either friends, family, or school. You don't need money to get rich. Next question, Melissa. Our next question comes from Blake in California. Favorite book, Rich Dad, Poor Dad. Since I am 16 years old and I've read Rich Dad, Poor Dad, I would love to invest in real estate, but I can't right now. What would be another good asset I could acquire? I am already investing in gold and silver, and I'd like to diversify. Good for you, Blake. 16 yeah, years old. I, good I, job. I started in <laughs> silver in 1964. But that's a whole nother story why there's gold and silver. But the most important things you're looking at, it's the same thing. I, I would never use the word I can't. That's a, that, that I can't is, can't is the word of a loser, of somebody who sells themselves short. And so that's why I was talking about what Dr. Tina Selig's book was about, What I Wish I Knew Was 20. She was also a neuroscientist. And when you say you can't, it's because your fear is talking. That means you don't have any guts. You don't have a spirit. You sell your soul for five bucks. That's the problem. You let money be your God by saying, I can't afford it. That's why lesson number one in Rich Dad, Poor Dad is the rich don't work for money. That's my rich dad never paid me because it forced me to think and figure out. And like the way Rich Dad taught me, it was just simply playing Monopoly. You know, four greenhouses, red hotel. And Kim and I today today own about 6,000 greenhouses and several hotels. But if we said, I can't, if that became part of my vocabulary, it shuts down the brain. So I want to thank everybody for their questions. I want to thank Dr. Tina Selick. I want to thank David Stillman, father of Jonah Stillman, because they are the leaders of the world. A whole new generation is coming on to save us. 
from <laughs> the ills of the baby boomers, Gen Xs, and millennials. So once again, submit your questions to Ask Robert at Rich Dad Radio, and thank you for listening to this program.